I've been reviewing some of my older videos and I've noticed two things. One, most of them have terrible audio quality. And two, they're all very short. I think the brevity of the older videos is important. And I also think I should go back to making shorter videos. Now, I've got some time to kill since I refuse to upload the rest of the videos I finished last year until I can double check some stuff I've found in supplementary materials. I don't want another scattershot video like the last Bronx one. So, while I'd waked, I'd like to talk at you about Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure. Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure was released for the Game Boy Advance and Associated Systems back in 2004 in Japan, 2005 in Europe, and 2006 in North America, right around the time that developers stopped making games for the system. It's based on the Dragon Ball series, and its name is probably one of the more awkward attempts to reference the system it's made for that I know of. Banpresto gets top billing on the development and publishing side, but most of it was developed by Dimps, that workhorse dev we all know and have strong feelings towards one way or the other. And it's a fine game overall, but I specifically want to talk about the one-on-one -on -one mode that the game features. It's a diversion, a versus mode that reuses assets from the main game to provide a tournament fighter feel with some of the stronger characters that appear in said game. I'm not going to argue that it's actually some sort of deep fighting game. It's not built to be competitive, and although it might be possible to make some specific rule sets for players to use for the sake of serious competition, this one-on-one -on -one fighting mode doesn't lend itself to that sort of meta-level sportsmanship. Obviously this hasn't stopped anyone from running money matches for the game or anything like that. I've borne witness to that myself. I'm just saying that there's a reason why it has not, and probably will not, receive a sudden burst of interest the way that games like TMNT Tournament Fighters or Catherine have. However, it has the basic foundation of a fighting game, and it's that foundation that I want to mumble about into the void of the internet. This mode uses the GBA's four main buttons and the D-pad. The D-pad is used for your typical stuff, movement, forward and backward dashing, changing your trajectory after a jump, that sort of thing. B is used for attacking, along with directional buttons. A is used for jumping and alternate actions for specific characters. R is used for charging and firing bursts of energy, which is managed by one of those segmented power meters that Dims love so much. And L is used for unique actions, which usually boils down to using a after-image technique. Characters can also block by holding back, away from their opponents. Energy attacks are pretty straightforward for a Dragon Ball game. Charging up to the first two segments launches fireballs that can travel short distances, while charging up to the last two fires beams, with a full charge reaching all the way across the screen. Fighting one-on-one -on -one revolves around the rush gauge, which lies underneath the HP gauges of each fighter. This gauge is the key to one-on-one -on -one mode, which is built around clashing attacks, you see, every attack performed with B also doubles as a counter-attack, and when one attack touches another attack, the resulting clash takes a bit out of each fighter's rush gauge. When a fighter's rush gauge is depleted, the fighters enter a state called break. Think of it as a more exaggerated version of a guard break. Broken fighters can be hit with anything, but there's a very small window to take advantage of this state. Attacking after a break takes very little time, but doing anything else causes the combo to drop. Once a split second passes, the rush gauge fills up. Blocking physical attacks drains the rush gauge far more quickly than countering, so trading blows is the de facto way to defend yourself, as well as the main method of attack. There are also specific attacks that focus mainly on attacking or defending, performed by pressing up or down and B simultaneously. Up and B performs a parry that absorbs a hit without depleting the rush gauge, and down and B performs a low attack, usually some sort of sweeping motion, that takes a big chunk out of the opponent's rush gauge if it connects or trades with their attack. Fighters also have specific sets of attack chains, which loop into themselves or each other once they connect with the opponent. Chains are the main way that players can break each other's guard. 
Low attacks provide a lot of advantage, and they crush regular attacks and chains, but they take a lot of time to recover from, especially when they're parried. Parries, in turn, leave players vulnerable when they're whiffed. Chains are somewhere between the two in terms of risk versus reward, and when the opponent is broken, they provide more options. Pressing B repeatedly while on the ground performs a chain that knocks the opponent forward. Pressing forward and B on the ground performs a chain that launches the opponent far up and causes an automatic super jump on launch that follows them. If a player knocks an opponent against the wall, they can follow up immediately with a launcher chain. Mashing B in the air will perform another chain that finishes with some sort of strong attack, while up or down plus B will perform some other sort of attack, usually a wall splat or an ender that knocks characters back to the ground respectively. Most combos will follow this truncated magic series with a few variants here and there. The rush gauge captured my interest when I first played Advanced Adventure, and I still mess around with one-on-one -on -one mode occasionally just to play with it. It's basically a versus mode built on guard breaks. There are lots of games that feature guard breaks as a mechanic, but only a few of them allow guard breaks to happen over the course of an even match, and those games are usually extremely skewed. They either have a few characters that can do that sort of thing, or are so skewed towards character-based strength that everyone can break guards somehow. Advanced Adventure has nestled into a unique niche with this mechanic, and there aren't a lot of other games that do what this game does. Even so, the versus mode has its quirks, stemming from its nature as an add-on, that makes things a bit awkward. One-on-one -on -one was built with mashing in mind, and trying to play without mashing can hold you back. Let's use parrying as an example. When you whiff a parry, you can attempt another one if you wait a split second, or attack immediately. But if you try to parry consecutively as quickly as possible, you attack instead. Thing is, forward attacks can sort of crush neutral attacks. They rip a big chunk right out of the rush gauge when they trade with your neutrals. So getting that accidental attack can cost you dearly. And yet, the timing for that second parry in a row is risky too. There's enough time to get clipped with any quick attack, and an unguarded attack takes the most rush gauge out of them all. So your safest option is to mash first, then parry. Same goes for low attacks. Hit the low attack, then mash, then go for another one. Trying to hit multiple low attacks in a row just means you're more likely to clip the opponent with one after a break, and that's not great. Since using a low on a broken opponent causes instant knockdown and all knockdown states in this game are invulnerable. Well, outside of, of applicable glitches, of course. You can kind of coax the mashing, control it to a degree, but you'll still be pressing B more often than not. There are other quirks about the game too, such as subsequent breaks. The timing is a bit strict, but you can break opponents repeatedly. Any physical attack that lands during the break will break the opponent again, but any ender for an attack chain will either send opponents into the wall or the air. Furthermore, the inputs for these chains are very loose. It takes about a second for the chain to stop before you can start it over again manually. I think that's a good thing, but it's another example of a very specific limitation that's put into the game. The afterimage move is another thing that seems to be blown wide open. At first glance, it seems to take half of a segment of a bar to use, but that's only if you have at least that much. If you barely have any key left, it'll work just as well. It always places you behind your opponent, which can be disorienting if they backdash behind where you teleport. And although it supposedly acts as a counter, you can use it far away from your opponent's attacks. So long as they've committed to a move, that move will trigger the after image. These details make the move versatile, but again, there's a bit of jank to it. The key moves are an interesting case. They are also janky, but I suspect that this is intentional jank. Basically, it takes a few hits for any energy attack to cause hit stun. These hits land quickly if they land in the center of a sprite, but if characters jump over it, they can slip past these beams, even if the beam connects initially. It takes three or four hits from a projectile to break the opponent. Blocking works well against beams for this exact reason. Projectiles take far less out of the rush gauge during a block. Also, until the exact frame that the beams come out, 
the character that shoots it is vulnerable and is locked in place during the start of the animation. So you can really clobber someone by jumping or zipping past them, then punishing them. These are really just nitpicks at heart, but I think they also illustrate just what the game was designed around. I believe that some of these things are deliberate choices made to prevent the game from becoming too technical. Many of Dimps' employees have a background in fighting games, and the head producer of Advanced Adventure, Hiroshi Matsumoto, has a lot of fighting games under his belt, so I think they knew what they were doing. If someone were to take the foundation laid down in this one-off side game and build on it, they could probably make something interesting. They might even be able to cut out a few of the buttons involved. Some of the stuff that's mapped to the shoulder buttons could probably be put to button combinations instead, and you could end up with a two-button fighter that's actually decent. Although people would probably make macros for those button combinations anyway, which would defeat the purpose of such a move. I see a lot of potential in this one-on-one -on -one mode, and considering how low-key respected the game is to this day, I just hope someone can capitalize on that potential within the next 20, 30, 40 years. Or maybe Etoif will come and sweep everything away and someone will come across it naturally. Who knows? In any case, I've got my fingers crossed.